last week. I think you, uh, you you missed the meeting because it was 419, but it's glad to, we're glad <laughs> to have you here. We're glad to have you here this week with us. So Dar- Darson Hemmings, a man that does not need a, an introduction. First off, we'd like to welcome, first off, we'd like to welcome you to the podcast. We want to... Uh, I just want to take a minute to introduce our sponsor, CanadianProtein.com. If you're sick and tired of looking like a soy boy, like Aaron Gall, you're going to go on there, get some protein. You're going to use the promo code CHOKE and get yourself 10% off. That's CanadianProtein.com, promo code CHOKE, 10% off. Aaron, this this is where you start This is where I jump in now? Okay. Yeah, this is where you start talking. <laughs> so we are here today at Shopping Houses Podcast with Darson Hemmings. Darson, thank you very much for jumping on. We do appreciate it. How have things been? Uh, it's great, you know. Um, some time off due to COVID, of course. But uh, I don't know, the fight life is different, you know. Like, we need that break sometimes, you know. You're overtrained, you're beat up. So I was pretty appreciative of the time off. Unfortunate circumstances. But, you know, that's life for you, I guess, you know. You got to roll with the punches. What have yeah, you absolutely. What have you been doing the last uh, couple months? Like, have you been doing some secret training, or like, are you like, what do you what have you been up to like the la- last few months? Like, what have you been working on? Um, well, first, I, I actually wasn't doing any training at all. Um, I was just bulking. I was just like legit, just sitting on a couch eating a lot of food, but it was very, <laughs> yeah. very strategic bulking, you know. I uh, had the plan. So, and I got com- cankles a little bit. The complete yeah. opposite of what uh, Aaron's been doing the last few months. Exactly. <laughs> Not strategic bulking. Just bulking <laughs> in the just bad bulking. variety. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I was going heavy on the pasta dishes, heavy on the carbs. And then, um, yeah, once I got cankles, I knew it was time to work out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then you were getting real chubby. You're like, you're like wobbling as I'm walking. I'm like, okay. I just started deadlifting, squatting, and turning into muscle now. So I started doing that and and doing a little bit more training here and there, like in the backyard, you know. Can't talk too much about Underground Fight Club, but you know how that is. We we don't we don't discuss that here. We don't we don't talk about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's perfect. First, first, so like, rule, first rule of uh, COVID Fight Club, don't get herpes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the first rule. Second rule, don't discuss it. Yep. So yeah. how did you kind of like modify your training, especially like over COVID? Was it more kind of like, did you have equipment or did you just like kind of work with what you had? Like, how did it go around? Um, so I went to my gym and I, I grabbed my mats actually because we were unable to open. So I'm like, okay, put them to good use. Me and Eric, we grabbed our mats and we just mat up our house. Like not in the actual house, but we have the mats there and we'll put it in our backyard, Eric in his backyard, me in my backyard. I will just call a couple of friends over, you know, a couple of like really like close friends and we'll just like spar for an hour, you know? And mm-hmm. to be honest, that's my favorite way to train as well. Like I love to, um, just kind of not really drill, but like a, a level above drilling, you know, you're not going too, too hard, but you're still drilling, you're repping, but we're still kind of rolling, you know? So I, I love to do that a lot. So I've been doing a lot of that and doing a few private lessons here and there as well. Um, like social distancing, of course, like we have like the mask involved or like we can wear gloves, all that stuff. So staying busy, staying active, but um, just less volume and more just focusing on, quality of training you know and of course it's really nice to be outdoors as well different view different different scenery so it's good i had a good one, time one thing i wanted to ask you because you mentioned something um there's a lot of people when it comes to training like how do you like what's how do you structure your training like what's a typical like what's like the ideal like training session for you is it pure drilling is it just pohada every day is it like a mixture of the two like how do you for yourself, what do you find, like, what works for you? Um, I, I don't really drill. I, I like to just flow roll. Uh, I actually love when they roll me and I drill on them. It's kind of, like, rude in a way <laughs> because, like, they, they want me to roll them back. But, like, you have to find the right partner, you know. It's someone who's not too good where you can't drill on them, but they're not, like, you know, fresh white belt where, like, you know, it's not realistic. So I love that, like, blue belt, purple belt level where I can just repetition and they're learning from me. I'm learning from them because I'm, I'm hitting like high repetitions. 
So I prefer that over anything else, to be honest. Like every now and then I, I like the pojada rolling like once a week, you know, maybe twice a week if I'm feeling really good. But generally avoid injuries and just like rep, rep, rep while they're rolling though. So I get, I get realistic um, reactions. I get different reactions. I get unique reactions. I'll stop and I'll talk about a position. I'll break it down a little bit. I'll, I'll do a slight variation, you know? So basically what you like to do is just find somebody who's a lot weaker and worse than you and just beat them up. <laughs> beat That's them like... up for an hour and a half nonstop. Literally, but like, it, like no need for water break. It's funny though, because like, uh, there was like a podcast with like Joe Rogan, a bunch of other people. They're like, if you want to get really good at jujitsu, you're beating up. Like if you're a black belt, you're beating up like blue belts and purple belts because yeah, not necessarily, tough. not necessarily white belts because sometimes they don't give you like the right reaction and they don't know how to yeah. react in ways where somebody who like knows a little bit of jujitsu would react versus yeah. like somebody who's a blue belt and a purple belt, they kind of know the reactions to certain positions so that that way, like you can work your thing and you can kind of see what's coming. I think it, it's beneficial as well. Like it, every round doesn't have to be with like somebody like equal level or above and you're just getting beat up constantly. I think what you mentioned is very important. I think for your training, you need to, you need to roll with people that are slightly worse than you. This is why I always beat up Aaron, for example, and <laughs> no, it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> So this is where Mike thinks he's just going to trash talk me the whole podcast instead, but I'll, I'll come up with some stuff later. I'm not worried. Um, I wanted to ask you, cause like, especially through uh, like your dedicated career, like you've had, like, like how did your beginning start? Like, where did you kind of like start with jujitsu and like, obviously it's manifested over the years. So kind of like, how did that story all begun? Oh man, I, I kind of just always grew up liking to fight and, um, once I discovered jujitsu, it was so creative and artistic that that was like the style, you know, it looked cool. We can fight really hard. Me and my cousins, I can show them a couple of techniques. We could fight till the death and like drink a beer after, you know, like that was mm -hmm. amazing. That was a really, like really cool, you know, I love to box too, all that stuff, but you get, in, you get so injured, you know, so this is like a, like a good mixture of the, of the two and then competition, like, Man, I've always wanted to do wrestling in high school. I didn't get a chance to do that, so I took out my, my anger here in jiu-jitsu, I feel like, you know? So, yeah, it was like a little bit of both creativity, the art. I love control, the, like the body manipulation, you know? I love, like, those little things that I'm so, like, dorky about, you know? Like, I'd, I'd watch a lot of anime, and I just, like, you know, I watch, like, Naruto or whatever, you know, even, like, <laughs> Dragon Ball Z or whatever. And I'm like, man, I, I want to have techniques too. You know, I want to have moves too. Not just like a jab and a cross. I want to have like something really cool, like a barren bullet to the back or like a matrix, like heel hook, whatever, you know, like I want to have some cool moves, you know? So I really took it upon me to like, hey, I want to have cool moves. I want to be that anime character in the, in the, in the story that's like, you know, I want to be that guy, you know? So mm -hmm. I legitimately like lived my life as an anime character for like, the first like <laughs> like white belt or purple belt after like purple belt you kind of like, okay you know i i get it now i'm good now you know like i learned the art you kind of like the magic is not quite there it's still magical but like blue belt purple belt it's like it's all magic tricks you know after that you're like you kind of learn the smoke in the mirror behind things you're like okay now you're just like a badass now you know but at the very beginning and even even now still i still believe in like you know, like, even, like, man, it's embarrassing, but, like, bro, I, I like Harry Potter, bro. I'm about to go watch Harry Potter after this. <laughs> I'm like, man, I love magic, bro. I love the magic. I love, um, like, you know, the art of, like, you know, wizardry, bro. <laughs> He's like, you're, like, the millennial artiste of <laughs> the <distributor. laughs> Yeah, bro. Man, I, I play, like, so much, like, uh, there's like multiplayer online role playing games, you know, like uh, Warcraft or whatever, you know, like you got to level up your character, learn magic tricks. Like, bro, I'm all Jiu about that. Jujitsu is kind of like that. You're just like level, you're trying to level up slowly and Every you're trying day, to bro. amass yeah, new you're techniques. Cool. Yeah, you're like learning, you're reading books. Like, oh, I learned this new like technique, you know, like you add it to your arsenal. Like, you're, I don't know, it's amazing. Like, bro, it's beautiful. I, I've always had this. I've always had this theory, like when it came to like some somebody who's like a video game player or like a pro gamer. If they picked up jujitsu, 
Cause there's a lot of like strategy and a lot of like when, it, especially with like competing, there's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of like ins and outs to like, there's a lot of like technique. There's a lot of like tactics when you compete. There's a lot of like technical aspects and strategy. Did you play like a lot of video games growing up or? Bro, Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, <laughs> all those games, man. I played every single game, shooting games, fighting games, adventure games. So to me, like, like jujitsu is just one more video game to master, you know? And it's the most realistic, like, the graphics are so real, bro. Like, you know? <laughs> Doesn't get much more real than that. So, like, I just so, love it. What was your go-to game over COVID? Uh, over COVID? Lately, I've been really into mobile games. I've been playing uh, Call of Duty Mobile. Oh, you and <laughs> Matty Isaac and all those guys. <laughs> yeah, I got all the boys on it, you know, we got chat going like <laughs> pretty good. I was I was over the over the COVID break. I was just like Matthew Isaacs on like his Instagram. It's just like him and then you know like the, the cut screen where it's like everybody's in the chopper and they're about to yeah. like land. Like yeah, yeah. there was a good month I'm like okay I'm going on Instagram and I just see it's like all right Darson Hemmings is like okay Darson <laughs> he's like you play with like you're playing with all your buddies and then it's like oh Matthew Isaacs what I wonder what he's doing. Same thing. It's like him yeah. on the shop. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's all you guys are doing. <laughs> all of these are just like taking everyone's soul, bro. It's so good. I, I, I never was into like um, like NBA games, bro. Like, it's so weird for me. Like NBA 2K or like, or, like I don't know, even NHL games. I, I just, they don't move the same way like real sports. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I don't right. like those games. Oh, oh the, well, the one back in the day, NBA Jam. I got to get the – because now they have yeah, the arcade boxes. I got to get yeah. the Jam of that. That'll be – Yeah, that was the only basketball game worth playing, bro. I'm telling you. All these NBA 2K Live, this and that. Bro, no, bro. NBA Jam, bro. NBA Jam. Is that Shaq break the, break the rim, break the – Oh, break the – yeah, and it was the firebomb yeah. going through for the dunk. Yeah, yeah, I remember Yeah, that. yeah you, like, leave the arena, drop back down, like, dunk it mm-hmm. over. By far, yeah. by far the greatest. You can like dunk from like the other side. Of, by far the greatest. Uh, I think maybe one of the greatest sports video games like ever created. That ever. like like NHL '94 as well. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Those, those classic NHL games were gangster, bro. Those, those fights, amazing. those fights, bro. Oh man, you're bringing me back, bro. You're bringing me back. Well, well, like, I think you know, Jitsu's just another video game, Aaron. <laughs> one more video game faster, bro. Well, especially like with NHL 93, 94 on Sega, it was like the Toronto Maple Leafs was like an undefeated team. You couldn't beat that team because they were <laughs> stacked, right? And then now it's all shit. Yeah. <laughs> there was a time. There was a time, man. There was a time. It was good. Thank you, baby. There was a time oh. when I was like five years old and when they were good. <laughs> Now well, I'm, old, I'm older than both of you guys, so I, it was like I was still like probably ten when that stuff came out. <laughs> <laughs> you remember it? You're like, yay, go Leafs, go! Now you're just those are good days. Those are good days. Yeah, good you, days. you just slip at Tim Hortons cup, just like <laughs> you know, we've come so far, the wrong way. So far. One thing I wanted to ask you actually is, okay, so we we talked about how you got into jujitsu. It's just another game, but like. What were some of the places that you trained at? Like you started, uh, what was like one of your first gyms, like your experiences there? Um, just just kind of going through like the ranks, like take us through like, just take us through like kind of like your training history. Like you've trained a, a lot of different gyms all over the GTA. And what were some of like well, the takeaways maybe from each one? So I, I actually began my training in London, Ontario at Team Tompkins. Rest in peace, uh, Sean Tompkins. He was like a really good coach towards me. I didn't get to know him too well, but I liked his attitude, liked his energy. And he just kind of started me off, you know, the whole um, uh, Chris Hordesky, um, you know, all those like UFC fighters, you know, it was cool to be around them and just get that vibe. They were strikers, but um, they also did a little bit of grappling. So I, I, went, I went to their gym mainly for that, but I did some striking too. After that, I moved to Brampton. And uh, that's when I really began my training. Like, I oh, my- you poor <laughs> thing! Why would you do that? <laughs> oh man! Hey, bro, for, from London, Ontario to Brampton, we're moving on up, bro. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you might have a point there, actually. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so so I went to. Um, I knew I wanted to train right away. I moved to Brampton. I knew like 
bro, I was trying to go to Pat Militich in America, bro. Like, I, I was watching the old school UFC, so I'm like, oh, Pat Militich camp, all those guys. Like, I, I need to go live in the in the woods, in the in the mountains, you know. Like, I was <laughs> down, ready, in Iowa, bro. down in I Iowa. Down in Iowa. Bro, I mailed those guys. I'm like, man, if you allow me to come to your trading place, whatever, whether, whether in the woods, in the forest, whatever, bro, I will come live there, sleep, eat gruel, and just train with, like, monsters, you know. And I have no, bro, I barely could do a jab, bro. I just know I want to fight. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, uh, so I started training in Woodbridge. Now I did I did a little bit of gi with um, Danny. Oh, and, Dan Maroney! Uh, Shout out to him. That, Podcast yes, with Dan Maroney. He had me, and, and he knew right away. Like I had something kind of like special because I came to class with a huge five star binder. I had no <laughs> uniform. I had to just like borrow a uniform, but I had my books, bro. I was ready to learn. Ready to learn, bro. Let's go. So um, he just started like, teaching the arm bars, teaching everything. I just, I'm just there. I just, everyone circled up, like learning. I'm writing all this down with like a pen, drawing down diagrams. <laughs> Where I'm like, man, I need to learn the technique. So we break. We like learn the technique. Here, yeah. arm yeah. bar, yeah. break. Let, let <laughs> raise hip on the elbow joint. You know, <laughs> like bro, it was so ridiculous, man. So that was a good time. I did like a month or two there. I got beat up by like some of the tiniest guys, skinny dudes, you know, like just long, lanky like, kids. Everyone would just beat me up, bro. I was like, man, I wasn't ready for the gi. I was doing no gi before, but I wanted to learn the gi as well, you know? I'd, I'd actually, like, before I even went to a gym, I was watching Marcelo ADCC highlights. I was watching, I was typing jujitsu and watch all day. I was so into it. And then, um, and I met Michael Imperado um, through my cousin. And after that, he introduced me to Sam Zakula. So I started training with Michael and Parado. He would pick me up every day, drop me off at a gym. We would train together. He would drop me back home. Like, you know, super generous. I noticed a lot happening with Mike in his life. But honestly, I always have to, um, like, give him a shout-out and say thanks. Because, like, bro, for, like, two years maybe, he'd pick me up every day. Beat me up, of course. He'd beat me up at the gym. We'd have, we'd have, wars. We'd have wars. You know you'd beat me up. And then uh, I need to jump back <laughs> after, you know, and he got me a lot of work too. Like I needed like some money. We'd like his, his family had like some companies and stuff. So I would work with him as well. So that, that was like my blue belt years, you know, that was huge for me. It got me like into the doors. I lost so much competitions, but you know, by time, like 20 competitions in or whatever amount, I started winning. And I also had like a huge winning streak. So that was like a huge part of my life. You know, that huge winning streak showed me that, hey, I can actually do something large in jiu-jitsu that I haven't lost in like over a year. So I went to the Pan Ams. I won the Pan Ams that year, like 2011 or something. And I, I came second in the Absolute, which was huge. I fought like many great players, you know, and like I was, I was, I was like 135 only. So that was, uh, that was Nogi Pans, right? In New York? Yeah, no, the Nogi Pans are purple okay. belt. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge thing for me. It made me realize like I could do something special. You know, it's the Pan Ams. I'm on, I'm on the I'm on the open weight podium with giants. You know, like I felt like you know the hard work is paying off. So then um, the following year, I did the ADCC trial. I I really didn't think I was gonna win it. I got like a special trip from a friend of mine who worked at Air Canada. He got me a flight. I just went down to try it out. Sure enough, I won the trip to Beijing. I was. Honestly, to this day, I'm still shocked. I, I, I had, like, four submissions, like, five matches. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, bro, I went there with, like, no money. I slept outside the venue even. Uh, Ricardo Amendolia, he, um, he got me some work that morning of the competition. I, he helped me. Um, I put the mats up for them, and I got paid, like, 100 bucks for something. And, bro, honestly, I was so thankful. I was like, bro, this is how I'm going to get home. I need to, like, catch the subway, catch the bus. I'm all the way in L.A., I haven't, I don't know anybody. And it was cold too, bro. I was like, how is it cold in LA? I was like, so dumb, you know? I was like, I'm in LA, bro. How am I cold? I'm wearing a winter jacket. I'm wearing like four sweatpants, like overnight, you know? I'm like, bro, I, I came here for a little vacation type of you're in the you know? You're in the middle of the desert. That shit cools off very quickly. <laughs> bro, super quick, bro. Too quick. Too quick. Never learned my, I never uh, forgot that lesson, you know? And then, and then after that, I won the world championship at Purple Belt for Nogi. So I had like a, a pretty good run in Nogi before switching to the, to the Gi, you know? What made you decide to switch like at that time? Like, was it just like, hey, I want to do something else. I want to 
I'll, I'm going to curry on Shnogi and do Gi or no Gi and do Gi now. Like what was, what was kind of like your thought process from switching from one to the other? Um, it was a mix because um, my last year of doing no Gi, I only watched the Gi. I, I watched so much no Gi matches. I couldn't watch anymore. I was like, I was like sick of it. So I started to watch only Gi matches. And um, so my game changed. I started to play. I was doing no Gi, but my game was very like, Gi oriented, you know, I would do, I would do the lasso, I played De La Hiva, I would try Barambolo. So I knew that these things would be easier if I put the Gi on, but I knew it would, I'd also get beat up because I don't do much Gi. I would do, I would train with Wagney a little bit and Wagney would just beat me up so badly that I was like, Gi is not for me, you know, I, I, I don't want, I don't want to lose. You know? <laughs> he, he does that to a lot of people, so I don't think you can yeah, feel yeah, that. No, like, yeah. like, bro, this guy is one of the best, you know, but like, but I was doing so well in Nogi that, like, man, it was hard to tear, it was hard to like take a loss, you know. But I knew I had to do what I had to do. And then uh, the, the other reason is, after I won the Nogi Worlds, I looked up in the podium, or sorry, I looked up in the stadium, and it wasn't as like filling. It wasn't as full. It was like when you, when you watch the Gi Worlds and you, after you win, you look up, it's packed. Everyone's screaming, teams or whatever. You like open your Gi up and like. You saw your abs, like, ah, you know, like, <laughs> it's epic, you know? When, when I won in Bogey Worlds, I was like, yeah, I look up, I was like, oh, it's not, it, it wasn't that crazy. <laughs> there's like five, there's like five people watching. This. Yeah, this bro, there's like, like <laughs> full, you know what I mean? Like, it was nothing as prestigious as the Gi, you know? And I really wanted that feeling. But it's funny because I look back now, and no Gi is so popular, it's so much money, super fights. I just like kick myself, bro. I messed up, brother. I messed it's, up. It's, it's funny because at that time, I think like, and this was around like maybe like 2013, 2014. Yeah. I would yeah. say like it, probably in the last five years, I think the Nogi kind of super fight, yeah. pro, ADCC, I think that's gained, that's, gained a, that's gained a lot more popularity, I would say the last few years a lot. You know, than versus when you were actually doing a lot more yeah. no gi. When I was doing it, people were like, oh, you doing no gi, bro, put the gi you were do You were doing it, you were doing it before it was cool. Yeah, <laughs> bro, yeah, right? I'm you're the hipster who started no gi and you're like, you know what? I'm going to switch to the gi. I'm the first person that was doing no gi before all you guys were. You fucking, yeah. fucking losers. <laughs> now they're all on it, you know what I mean? They're all doing a no gi, getting paid like how much money for like super fights. Bro, I gotta do like eight matches to get a, like a medal. They do one fight. Like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, I chose the wrong sport, bro. I got finessed, bro. I switched the wrong time. If I just stuck it like one more year later, bro, one more year, it'd been good times, bro. Gordon Ryan came in, changed the whole game. <laughs> he did. Well, I think <laughs> I, I think it's just the the trend is. But I think you know what, like, I love we, her too. Yeah, I love the I, techniques. We had, we had Ricardo on a while, uh, actually like just like a week or two ago, and we were talking about like the trends of like jiu-jitsu. There's always new trends. So it's like, okay, like deep half guard's cool in 2019. Now in like 2025, it might make a comeback. You never know. So I think, I think there's going to be a rotation. I think right now, I think no gi is gaining a lot more popularity, but I think probably down the road, gi – something will probably happen and then that will create some popularity as well whether it's more money getting put into the geese side of things or you know. yeah hey with, with all the heat with like Kanan Duarte and Gordon Ryan like oh they're, they're trying to get fights going but like oh come over to the gi you know you come over to no gi that that's like creating the friction to like allow it to happen you know like even golf vials like oh put the gi on come fight me in the gi Gordon's like, nah, I, I do more rule sets in Nogi. I'm like, I get that he does more rule set in the Nogi, but like, bro, ultimately just put the gi on. And I, I get where Gordon Ryan's coming from because I was the same way. I'm like, oh, I'll never put the gi on, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of see what he's saying, but like, bro, I was in the same shoes, bro. Like, just put the gi on, show respect for jujitsu. If you really love jujitsu, I believe these guys can do both, you know? I don't know why he doesn't do both. It kind of, it kind of upsets me, but teacher so he's making, bro, he's making millions of dollars so i can't really say anything you know can't knock his hustle do you think he'll switch into the gi or you think he's hardcore like i'm not going to do it at all well he trains in it i see him training in the gi yeah. I, I i believe i believe if he does get good enough he will but i'm pretty sure like guys are giving him a hard time where he's like he's not gonna put it out there to display yet you know but one day hey you never I 
who gets really good, he, I, for, I know him for sure, bro. He will definitely challenge people if he actually has the skill to win. I think – well, I think he just knows what he's good at. I think his game is very Nogi-based. Like, I don't yeah. think he, he – like, he's not, like, a heavy, gripping, like, spider guard kind of kind of player, which relies a lot more on the gi. So, I think he, he has a very Nogi-based game, and I think he knows what he's good at. So, I think for now he's going to stick at it. But, you know, who knows? We'll see. Yeah. We'll see down the road what can, what can happen. So, then you switch to the gi. Um, what are some of the things – like, what – so, you, you switched – from uh, no gi, started training a lot more gi. And then, like, what were some of the things that you, you found at first that were difficult? And then, like, kind of competing and getting into more, like, training there. Like, how did, how did you develop that? Um, so, yeah, so I put the gi on. I, I went to Open Mat at first. So, Open Mat Mixed Martial Arts in Toronto. And it, it was difficult. But at the same time, again, I was one of the bigger guys in the room. So, like, Open Mat, it's like uh, – Open mat is like like predominantly 155ers and under. There's a couple of heavier guys. So being a bigger guy in the room, I didn't have too much struggle. I was able to like, you know, compensate for like my lack of, which gave me a lot of time to learn. But um, guys like Old Stop were, were like very tricky. You know, they would, they would like, ah, man, they would, they would grab my ankles a lot. I didn't like that at first. They would grab your ankles, like, you know what I mean? And then they start Toriando bullfighting. So right away, I, I learned to, like, you know, play off the sleeves. You know, I actually, I didn't even put off the sleeve. I would just grab the ankle. I played De La Hiva, and I would just be, like, powering out, bro. Like, I, they would be grab my ankles, I would attack, and they would attack, and whoever's attack would, would like, would come out victorious, basically. But over time, like, and, and now what I really love, I love retaining the guard. So, like, I'm all about the sleeve grips. So you're no longer, like, going power for power or attack for attack, but just retaining, controlling, and just kind of going with the flow, you know, I, I love to do that a lot. So I, it took me a long time to learn that, but that was like the first step is just dealing with being gripped up, especially the ankle grips. That was like the worst thing ever, you know? If you were going to go back, like, so you've, you've had like, I would say a fairly unique, like kind of like jujitsu experience. You actually started no gi and then transitioned to gi. I kind of did something similar as well, where like I basically started doing no gi for like the first like year, year and a half. Then I put on the gi and I'm like, what the hell? People are grabbing me. Like, if you could go back, like, what were some things that you would do differently? Maybe about like, you know, your training or your mindset or like, what, what would you tweak going back now? Now that you're a black belt, what would you tell like, kind of like your blue belt self, like, you can go back in time and hop in the yep. DeLorean. Put the gi on earlier. Put the gi on earlier. <laughs> yeah. Wait so long. Put the gi on earlier. And and just take um, take the time to learn spider guard, you know. I, I always got frustrated, so I go back and just grab the ankle. It was very simple. But taking the time to really love to really learn that like Michael Lange style of like spider guard where you just hold the sleeves. You know, you develop strong finger strength and you're just very patient in the position, you know. I, I was always just so aggressive with my, with my style because I didn't have the control I wanted, but I knew I wanted to achieve it. So I, to the, to the, today, I feel like I have somewhat what I want, but, you know, just more control, more sleeve grips. Like, don't give up on that, you know. Don't give up no matter how hard it is. It's like the right path to learn, you know. How do you feel your um, like when you look at like body like injuries or recovery? Do you feel you was getting more injured in no gi or was it vice versa? Uh, I would get more injured in no gi. Mm. Sure. Like more like the explosiveness and kind of yeah. less grips, I guess. Yeah, things happen so fast. You get you get fatigued. Once you get fatigued, injuries become become like a lot more. Um, uh, like you know, this happened a lot more. So I'd be fatigued, and we're like we're sweating. We're you know we we can't really finish each other because we don't have enough grips. So we just have like long fights, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, you slip here or like they fall on you here, or you know, you just move a little bit wrong. The knees are always getting tweaked. I used to do a lot of heel hook as well. Like back then, heel hooks were like very um, they're they're more allowed, not so much, but like people were just work were like working the heel hook a little bit. So I've actually been heel hooked really badly a couple times, popped my knees. And um, that injury, like, even to, like, to, like, to this day, I'm still a little bit injured in my knees because of, like, heel hooks and all that stuff. So, yeah, no gi definitely hurt me a lot more. In the gi, I've had a couple injuries, but nothing crazy. Mm -hmm. 
Who went um, surgery on the knee or just kind of just like, laying it out? Like all surgeries, man. I hate I hate surgeries. I hate going to the hospital. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Right. You're, like, you're like you're just gonna hobble around like I do everywhere, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had I, I cast on my knee at one point. I can't remember. Like it was so traumatizing. Like I almost forgot. It. Like I try to like rip, like forget what happened. But I think they might have like popped my knee. Yeah, yeah. They, they just popped it back in a place. All they did, and they put it just like a, a crack. Go for it. Yeah, and I, and I was, but it was so stuck, you know, because when it happened. I like waited so long that I, like my knee could not move. So when they moved it, it was like, bro, I just remember. I want to remember. <laughs> is, this when, is this when you dis dislocated your kneecap or? Um. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that one super fun I had. Um. In like Brampton, I had like a, this guy just like got me like ten different heel hooks, and eventually I I tapped, you know. But like the first one hurt me, the second one hurt me, the third one like the video is actually on YouTube. It's so painful. It's like. You just watched me just getting like heel hooked left, right, and center. And <laughs> I think I, I think I think I remember that match. Like it was just heel hooks oh, everywhere. Was, heel hooks, heel yeah. hooks everywhere. Yeah, bro. I just, I had to get like picked up on the mat to like have him like raise his hand after it. It was crazy, bro. I'll never forget like you know looks, man. And 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 to be honest too, I was training the gi, but he wanted to fight me. I guess like people like, oh yeah, I heard he did this and this and no gi. Let's fight. I'm like, bro. I don't even train Nogi anymore. Like, I really am over it. But, like, you know, I'm not going to say no to a fight. So, I, I just took it and I learned, I learned a good lesson that day. So, there was a time you kind of dabbled in MMA at one point, wasn't there? Yeah. I had a lot of fun with that. Um, I fought once. Because, again, like, my coach, when I, when I first met Sam Zakula and Michael Inferato, I was doing Nogi, but they were priming me for MMA. So, like, everything I learned was, like – was almost MMA oriented. So mm -hmm. eventually my time came to fight. And uh, I just fought one fight in like Ohio, I believe. My opponent actually backed out. So I, I had to fight some guy last minute. And um, that was like nerve wracking, you know? And it's like, I don't know him, he doesn't know me. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to prove that Jiu Jitsu works in MMA. I wanted to prove to my friends, to like, you know, people who believed in me, you know what I mean? Like, people were watching me. I wanted to show them, like, hey, you know, like Damon Maya. I love watching Damon Maya back in the day. So I want to do something similar, you know? And, um, but once I got in the cage, I don't know, man, just something else changed. I was like, <laughs> show, <laughs> show <laughs> yeah, I wanted to just grapple, but like, I, they, they shut the door. I was like, bro, I could punch this and not, and not be in trouble. <laughs> You know, you potentially get knocked out, and I'm like, I'm totally fine. You know, what I mean, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get punished. You know, so I started to fight this guy, and like, he was a striker, so I didn't really get much going there. But once I took him down, I was like, should I go for a submission? Nah, like twenty bombs to the face. You know, <laughs> it was so like satisfying, bro. I love the feeling. It was like, man, leather to face, bro, just punching and like being allowed to like, you know, go at it, like not like sparring, like. But we're going at it, you know. Mm -hmm. Try to talk about like it was pretty wild, man. Well, if you want, uh, so you're currently one. Is was that an amateur fight or a pro fight? Um, it should have went for a pro actually. It should have been a pro fight. We didn't wear any gear at all, and I got paid for it. But for oh, that was oh, so pro, technically that should be pro then. That should be yeah. pro then. Yeah, bro, tell sure dog, bro. They have me there as one no amateur. I'm like, man, I took a pro fight, bro. I trained for a pro fight, everything, like. I got paid five hundred. If you got paid, five, that's a pro hashtag, fight. Hashtag I got paid five hundred. That's a pro <laughs> yeah. fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah bro. Anytime I, you get paid, I, I it's pro fight. Like, bro, all those guys were there in the corner. You know, it was, it was legit. But hey, we uh, we we need we need to set up another pro fight. Uh, Aaron Gall wants to make his uh, pro <laughs> debut. He's oh, currently gosh. one and zero. Oh. <laughs> He's <laughs> one and zero oh as an amateur. <laughs> Darson Hemmings versus Aaron Gall. No. <laughs> no. Those days are done. Aaron, you're, Aaron uh, for, for those who haven't heard, you're, uh, what can you please tell your – because this is my, maybe one of my all-time favorite Aaron Gall stories – your 1-0 amateur fight at, at uh, the gym that we do not speak of. 1-0. 1-0 no amateur fight. It was a uh, charity fight, so it was good. So it, went, it lasted three rounds, and I armbarred him in the third round. I felt good about it. <laughs> I felt good about it. 
He basically picked on like one of the sales staff, and he's like, "You don't want the sales staff. It wasn't the sales staff. You, you are next." <laughs> Throw, throws him in the ring, and it just starts beating on him. I think <laughs> you might have hit him with a chair at some point. Yeah. So what? What kind of like? Because you had the one. How come you were just like one and done, or just kind of wasn't something for you? Well, that's the other half of the story is that, man, leading up to a fight for, like, three weeks, bro, I had, like, nightmares every day, man. I was like, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go into a cage, and I potentially can die. <laughs> like, that's all I would think about. Like, I'm going to go into a cage, and I could potentially die that day, you know? Like, so that was, like, a really important day of my life, bro. Like, I, I could potentially realistically die that day, you know, because I don't want to give up. You know, I mean, I'm not gonna like stop fighting. Like, I can, I can imagine worst case scenario. I'm just getting like, like smashed and just not giving up. Like, oh man, I'm fine. Like, you know, when you're fighting, you get hurt, but you don't really feel it. Like, you're bleeding. You got like, yep. a huge ash where you're like, I don't even know until you look in the mirror. You know, like that's how I would fight. I would imagine like that. Like, oh, I'm not gonna give up. No, unless you knock me out. And, and even then, that's kind of a scary thought, like of being knocked out. You know, like. So I had all these weird, like, negative thoughts in my head where I was like, man, I really just love the art of jujitsu, and I'm just doing this to, like, not that I love fighting that much, but to prove a point, you know? Like, I'll fight if, like, you're back against the wall, I have no choice, I'll fight. But to, like, willingly, like, hey, me and you, let's fight right now. Like, that's just not my, like, mentality. That's not my character. But I just love the art of jujitsu. that's for sure. I'll never back away from jujitsu. Mm -hmm. It's to me, it's not a fight, you know, we're, we're, we're sparring, we're, like, working technique, you know, it's whatever, you know. It could be nerve-wracking at, like, competition, but, like, nothing like MMA where I'm like, man, we shake hands because we might not leave this cage, you know. Like, and, and that's the reality, man. It has happened, you know. So, yeah. yeah so, it's a different mentality. A lot of people say, like, oh, like, jiu a fight, this and that. Like, I don't, I don't consider jujitsu a fight when you're like double guard pulling and like you're pulling, yeah. on, you're pulling on pajama pants and everything. Like that's yeah. not a fight. Like people say like, Oh, this is, this is war. I'm going to grab that belt. And bear. I mean, there's aspects of fighting in jujitsu. Yeah. Like you're fighting, but like, you're not yeah, going to bring the fight, but you're not really fighting. You know I mean? Yeah. Like you're not like trying to punch somebody in the face. You're not yeah. going to you're not going to war. That's kind of an insult to the like military out there. Yeah. You're like, I'm going yeah. to war. I'm going to this white belt jiu-jitsu tournament. <laughs> okay, better kiss yeah. your family goodbye. <laughs> um, one thing I actually want to <laughs> one thing I wanted to ask you about uh, like kind of like diet nutrition, because I see on Instagram like you're eating steaks, you're eating a lot of meat now. I thought you were vegan, bro. What happened? <laughs> um yeah i was vegan for two years man i was doing really well and then uh it <laughs> fell off the wagon <laughs> bro I, I started lifting and i don't know where like the crave for meat just like just came back bro. i was like All right, i need like this protein bro i need protein and um and like also it's just like summer i'm smelling like the barbecue every time i'm smelling like steak <laughs> just like the grill i'm like holy man i don't know how i i don't know how i how i uh stayed away for so long you know that smell of the barbecue bro it was just you, can't, you, can't, you, you just can't stay away from the jerk chicken bro. the oxtail oh, yeah, the steak. I, actually, I, I finally had jerk chicken like a week ago bro so like, the first week of coming back to meat i had chicken i had chicken i had duck and then after that after a week i only had steak for legit like maybe two months i only have steak bro for breakfast, for lunch, <laughs> dinner. If not steak, it would be like a red meat, you know, like beef ribs or whatever. I was basically on the Brock Lesnar diet. And, uh, <laughs> and I was seeing results, though, because it's like heavy food, you know, it sticks to you. So I'd be, I'd be making more gains, bro. So I was, like, enjoying it. But now I'm, like, legit the last, like, five days now, like, I'm going back to, like, chicken, to, like, maybe some fish, maybe, you know, like, I need to chill out on the steak, bro. It was, like, it was too much, man. How did, you, how did you feel like being vegan for two years versus, you know, now, now you're eating meat. Like, how do you feel like jujitsu wise? How do you feel like weight training wise? I have my own opinion on it, but I want to hear yours. Um, I actually feel the exact same. I don't feel any different in terms of like energy or, or power. I just feel happier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, man, I just love to just bow into this thing, bro. I'm so happy after bowing it. Like, if I eat vegan food, I'm like, I'm like happy that, like, yeah, you know, 
I ate vegan. I feel good. I feel energy. I'm like, I don't, I don't have the craving for eating meat. That's cool, you know. But like, there's something just really happy about just mowing a steak, bro. Like, it's just so <laughs> chewy. Like <laughs> the flavor, <laughs> and it's so easy to make. Like vegan food. I'm like putting some veg here, this, some freaking like vegan butter, some coconut butter, some of this. You know, it seems like, like a lot of work. <laughs> slap on, the steak on the grill. Ten minutes later, I'm mowing, bro. It's just so good. Steak is just like sear, sear, cut, eat. Yeah. <laughs> cut, mouth, done, bro, done. How can you? So, how come you decided to go vegan originally? Was it a reason you did, or was it kind of like um, something to do? Or, well, my girlfriend at the time was vegan, but mm. I also, I also kind of wanted to be vegan for a little bit. Like my friends, like we, we eat a lot of different foods. We're like really into like food culture, you know. We're always cooking different things. And a lot of my friends eat a lot of vegetables. Like we're really into like healthy eating into like, you know, Googling, searching up, researching different foods and, you know, different effects of this, like kombucha, like that whole like, you know, when kombucha became popular a couple of years ago, like we were on that trend, right? We were like, oh, kombucha trend, you know, like <laughs> a little bit of alcohol in there, you know, let's get some alcohol before we train jiu-jitsu, you know, like that little 0.4%, you know, the kombucha. <laughs> And I, I, I would feel like I didn't, I don't really drink too much at the time. I still don't really drink too much, but I would feel the buzz, you know, like, whoa, bro, I'm kind of buzzing here. And he, and he just knows healthy too, you know? So, yeah. So we would do that and like just so much different trends, you know, like now they're really into craft brews. They, they love craft brews where there's like craft brews every night, you know, like, and um, so yeah, like whatever is like trending in terms of like health. I know craft brews isn't the healthiest thing, but like, it's, it's kind of cool, you know, it's like a, it's better, you know, it's nice. And um, Aaron, Aaron's more like the beer connoisseur out of the two of us. I don't really drink much. Yeah, yeah. I see your shirt. I see your shirt. I like that shirt. I actually want to get This is my Pride and Joy shirt, man. <laughs> get to that beer. <laughs> good old Jeff Santos gave the hookup. It was good. We need a we need a shout out. Um we need we need like a, a craft beer sponsor. We also need to get sponsored by uh there's a, a steak provider that me, you, and a, a lot of the the uh bougie BJJ aficionados. We need to, we need to get a, that sponsorship. We need to hook up Darson yeah, as well. We we actually got to hook up Darson because we have a guy that we've been using over the whole COVID um, lockdown for steak and like meat, any type of meat you want. The uh, Agu World Meats. Oh my god, Whoa. this guy is, Augie. This guy is the best. Augie. Augie, sorry. Augie, you just you just we just lost that sponsorship because you're completely no, 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 no. garbage. <laughs> 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 I'll edit that. He'll edit, edit that out. Edit. Shout out to shout out to Augie. You're not even an official sponsor yet, but you you guys make some good steaks. <laughs> this is this is the official uh, craft brew of the boys right here. What you got? What is this? Great Lakes. Oh, I'm Tomiko. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's an octopus that has boxing gloves on. He's basically <laughs> fighting. <Nice. laughs> yeah, it's what we it's what we drink around here. Nice. Craft brew. I just picked up some Muskoka brewery stuff. That's pretty good. I, I like them right now. Hey. That's hey. cool. They're, yeah. And yep. uh, also cool beers down the road from my um, my sister's place. So I've been there a couple times. They have that brewery up there. And if you ever want to go on a good brewery tour, go up to Cremor. Yeah. It's a little bit of a drive, but you go up to Cremor Brewery. They oh, Cre a, Cremor Springs and all yeah, that. Yeah, Cremor okay. Springs. They always have really yeah. good stuff. Cool, cool. But, um, yeah. One of the best places where I went for like craft beer was in Boston. So if you're ever going to go for like travel again, eventually if you go in the U.S., go to Boston and go do brewery tours in Boston. And I I, I'll tell you what, pretty good. I would yeah. imagine. I feel like um like Family Guy is like based off of Boston, no? The, like, uh, I, think, Family I Guy? think they're based in Rhode Island. I think Family Guy. Oh yeah. yeah okay. but, oh um, yes, yes. Boston but Boston's got like Saint Samuel Adams, and they got a whole yeah, bunch of they, yeah. They're known. They're known for that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, so, they also they also have Samuel Jackson as per Chappelle show. <laughs> 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 no <laughs> motherfucker, this is how I talk. <laughs> oh my. Uh, out, if, oh. if Samuel Jackson was a beer, I would drink it. For sure. For sure. <laughs> no, but you know what? So there was a place in Boston. So it was called, I went on this tour with my brother. And so there's a place called Night Shift Owl um, Beer Company or whatever. So we get on the bus 
And so we basically go into this like um, kind of like an industrial park or area for where outside of the streets of Boston. So it's not necessarily the nicest neighborhood. And so we go in there and before we get off the bus, he's like, okay, listen, now if anybody needs to go take a piss, go now because you don't want to go when we get in there. I was like, okay, like, what type of fucking place are we going to, right? So we fucking go in, because basically the whole premise of the night shift was because these guys worked during the day, and then they brewed beer at night, and then basically they would have parties at the night shift. That was their whole premise. That's what I call it, night shift. So we go into this place, and we're going down all these corridors, and it's basically a hole in the fucking wall, right? And it's just got kegs and everything like that, and they're just brewing stuff. But some of the sickest beers that they had, like like 6.8, 8% type beers, but they're fantastic. And there's this yeah. little hole in the wall. But yeah, yeah you don't always, want to take a always a hole in the wall. Always a hole in the wall. That way they're fully invested, you know? No money yeah. goes towards the building. Just pure. <laughs> it's just yeah. the beer. And it was good. That's it. Nice. Sometimes those are the best places where, where it comes to food, alcohol, it's the little like hole in the wall places. Cause I even remember like when I was in San Diego, if you're looking at like, if you're like a taco or a Mexican food connoisseur, you yeah. go to the, you go to the places where like, there's somebody who like, uh, legally immigrated across the border <laughs> and, they and they open up a shop that just says taco. Nobody speaks English. And yeah. like, it's by far some of the best like Mexican food I've ever had. The best, bro. The best. Bro, even like going, going back to jujitsu, bro, like some of the best gyms in Brazil, just holes in the wall, bro. Legit. You just go in the wall, you look in, there's like half a Mendez rolling. If, you, if you've seen the first like Atos gym, like that one little highlight, they made like a highlight for ADCC. You see like half a Guilherme, you see um, Bruno Frizzato, all of them training in like a little rectangle, bro. Like, if you move too much, you're going to hit the wall. <laughs> bro, like, if you, if you lay down from one, if you, your toes will be on one end, your head will be on the other end. But it's, like, a long, narrow, like, hallway, you know, but it's matted, bro. But it's, like, a hallway. Like, no more than a hallway. And they're rolling, bro. They're rolling so hard. And I'm like, man, just a hole in the wall, you know? Like, that's just the way it is, bro. In Brazil, man, these guys are so good, and they just are unable to, like, leave their country, you know? Like, but if they can leave their country, holy crap, bro. Jiu-jitsu, like, be a different look, Even looking at, like, uh, even looking at, like, what Cicero Costa's developed the last few years, that was just, like, a gym being run out of a church, threw down some puzzle mats, and then it's just, oh everybody's just, everybody's just murdering each other. Praise <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> well, we had, like, Fernand Fernando was on, he had, like, a hilarious story of, like, I don't know, he was getting like tapped by like the orange belts for just like killing them. And like, he's like, yeah. all right, he just got off the plane. He's like, Oh, I want to go train. And he goes to like the purple belt class. And then like, basically they just tr passed him around like a piece of meat for like an hour. Yeah. And, bro, like nobody, crazy. nobody knew. He's just like, Hey, I want to go train. And then just like, basically just like that Augie steak getting thrown to the lions. <laughs> yeah. Bro, trust me, man. There's so much like different levels to the game. It's like I'm always like so, I'm like, always surprised, you know. Even when like um like Breno came down from Cicero Costa from Brazil, he he brought like a different level of like training and pressure to the game, you know. Like I went to train with him the other day, and I was like, holy man, like the the intensity of the way you roll, even just in training, is like so high. He's like, man, in Cicero Costa, like when he first went there, that's what happened to him. You know, he went there. And their intensity was so high, like, not that he wasn't good, but the intensity that they trained at was so high that, like, it made him seem like he wasn't good, you know? So after a while of, like, hanging with that intensity, he was, like, telling me how, like, you know, it wasn't a lack of technique. It was just a lack of intensity, you know? So sometimes, man, just the hole in the wall, you got the toughest guys there, you know, or, like, the best food or, you know, like, the best brews, you know? Like, man, life the is best crazy. The best training. <laughs> yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you is um, just kind of changing gears. We talked about training a little bit earlier. Like what's um, – because there's a lot of different styles. Like you, you even just mentioned Breno. You kind of mentioned even as well. Like what's a typical class for you? Because like you even mentioned Breno has a certain intensity that like he trains at and he rolls at. There's You even talked about earlier there's a certain intensity or like certain partners that you like to roll with as well. But, like, let's say you're teaching because you you were teaching uh, out in uh, Scarborough a while ago. Like, what? Yeah. How, do you, how do you structure your class? Like, what's a typical class for you? What's a typical comp class for you? 
Um, how do you kind of like get the information out to your members there? Um, so we do like a really quick warm up because I, I, I expect people to come early for class and do their own warm up. It'll do like five minutes of your own, like on the side. And um, so when, when class begins, I want to get right away into the technique. You know, I love to break down techniques. I'm always watching what they're doing in class. So the next class, I can kind of add to what they're doing or like, you know, I see what's trending on the mat and I teach according to that. And, um, or if they have a question, I might just help them out. Like, oh, you have a question here or there. Okay, today's lesson will be about that question or about this position, you know? So I kind of change it up. I don't have like a strict curriculum, but um, maybe for like a month, we might work to Eva, you know? Or, you know, one random day, we might switch it up, something like that. So no curriculum. I just kind of go off my heart, off what I see happening, what I see trending. Um, or if I'm rolling them, like I, I like to roll the students as well. So after I teach technique for about, I teach technique for about 20 to 25 minutes and we roll after that for about 45 minutes. And as I'm rolling them, I'm taking notes in my head like, oh, this kid needs more clothes guard. This kid needs more De La Hiva. This kid needs more sleeve grips, you know? So I try to see, okay, next class who shows up. Okay, that kid is here that needed the De La Hiva. Uh, let, me, let me help with De La Hiva today. So I'll teach a class about De La Hiva. And then um, I'll also like go on the side and like help you help people out individually as well, you know, answer some questions like that too. So when you and Eric, do you guys, um, cause you're a co teach co co owner with Eric, right? Yeah. We teach, we teach um, different days. So when I'm there, okay. he wouldn't be there. Okay. But like when you guys, like the philosophy is kind of the same or do you guys ha have different approaches or um, slightly different approaches? But um, that's good, though. Like, I find uh, he teaches, like, the passing really well. I'll teach guard. And we'll even switch it up. You know, he'll show some guards, and I'll show some passing stuff. And, um, yeah, like, sim similarities, but definitely, like, slight differences, which I think is good for the kids, you know, to have. Because I'm always telling the kids, like, hey, there's no wrong way. You know what I mean? There's just a better way, a more efficient way, you know, but – what you're doing is like, don't ever feel like you're doing something wrong. You know what I mean? You just, just figure out what you're doing and apply it to the situation, you know, but never a wrong technique. I always say like, I'm, I always have a hard time finding a, a bad technique or a wrong technique, you know, maybe it's just the wrong time, you know, wrong place, you know, but never, no, nothing's wrong or incorrect in terms of technique. So. I think you met, you mentioned something important. Like it's, it's good to have, because I think this is what also worked for me and Aaron when we were teaching too. It's being able to have a lot of different styles of jujitsu and try to expose people to them as well, or different, even just different teaching styles. Like if even if you and Eric fan who have very similar games, you may teach it differently. And I think that's important as well. Yeah. Different mindsets on it for sure. Yeah. I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I, I've had so much different teachers. One one teacher I, I didn't mention in the in the convo is I, I traveled to go train with Ryan Hall for a bit, and like even even train with him, like I didn't I didn't say oh my other coaches were incorrect. I just um I just added more more knowledge, you know, like oh you know this coach likes single leg X, this coach likes um playing like De La Hiva, you know, like whatever it is. So he was a great coach for me as well. He changed my life, to be honest, like. To, to be around him. Like, I just, just, just to know who he was as a person, like was huge, you know, like I'm like, I'm hanging with Ryan Hall, you know, like, and he wanted me there. It wasn't like I came there to like see him. He messaged me like, Hey, come train with me for a while. You can stay at my fighter house, this and that. So he was really nice to me. He had me come out. I lived down there for like almost a year. And during that time, my game changed dramatically. I'd be rolling with Ryan Hall one-on-one -on -one all the time. I had new partners, new training partners, new lessons. Um, and, and that was before I won the ADCC trial. That was before I won the Worlds. But after I won those, I, I legit messaged Ryan Hall, like, hey, man, thank you so much for your training. Like, I really believed he helped me to get where I was, you know. So I always gave him a lot of credit for that. So you mentioned that, especially, like, yeah, like living in the fighter house, right? Because I think a lot of people don't understand what the fighter house is. So, like, what was that type of experience? Like, obviously this is a totally different world than a lot of people in like TO will be like, you know, living it because they're going home to their moms or dads or whatever, their own place. And now you're in actually yeah. in like a fighter house. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I'm kind of used to it, I guess, because my, my like jujitsu upbringing, I was like living in a gym for a bit. I was living behind a gym. 
I started living with a couple of my friends. They, 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 they like did jujitsu, so I would live with them, and like we would train at different times. Um, like so, like uh, Chris Larea, I lived with him for like almost a year, and his family. We would train in the basement almost every day, almost like every night. You know, we'd be training. I lived with um, uh, this guy Jason Gonzalez for a couple of years. Again, we just trained all the time. You know, we had mats in the house. So when I lived at Ryan Hall, it was no different, really. Like we just had mats in the house. There's a bunch of like weird cats everywhere, you know, like just kind of a kind of a sketchy <laughs> house. It wasn't like the most like elegant house, you know, and um, just a bunch of dudes. And it was like me, um, Seth, and this other guy. I can't remember his name, right? Oh, Kenny. Yes, Kenny. He was really good too. Jeez. And uh, so we'd be in the house together. Every now and then, like another guy would come every now and then to stay in the house. But generally, it was just us. And uh, we just wake up in the morning, you know, have our breakfast, and I'll begin my day. Yeah, like 7 a.m. class. I would go. I would go with Seth, and we would um, go to the morning class. I would, he would teach the morning class. I would. I would join in for a technique. I would join in for the rolling. Then we go back home, eat, come back again for a lunch class. Ryan would teach the lunch class. Go back home, eat, come back again for a night class, and I would go home and sleep. You know, and it was easy to do in a way because I don't have any other side work. I don't have any side job. Nothing to worry about. I just had some savings and just kind of like lived off my savings for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, but it's fun though, you know, just just wake up in the morning and just train. Didn't have to drive, nothing. Everything was taken care of. I had to just show up to class and just sweat, you know? Yeah. But it was nice. To say, yeah, no, it's, that's amazing because this is a lot of people won't have that experience. So it's good that you can yeah. kind of like shell that, tell that story. What would you yeah. uh, What would you recommend to somebody out there who's like maybe like a blue belt or somebody like you that was in that position years ago to like to find that training or to like if they want to get themselves to like the next level like what were some what are, what are some suggestions you would make to them? Um, social networking, man, is super important. You know, like always be putting out your content, put out your like record your matches, put your stuff out there because you never know who's watching. And you never know who is um, interested in like, oh, you know, this kid's working really hard to keep seeing you, you know, um, consistently posting your stuff. You know, people are, will, will be motivated, inspired. You never know. Like the world is, is, you know, billions of people out there. You never know who's, um, who's watching and who wants to help you, you know, who sees a little bit of themselves in you, you know. And as a result, they kind of like live vicariously through you type of thing, you know, so they want to help you out here and there. So I, I found out all through my life, you know, as I keep working hard, keep putting on my stuff, you just find nice people in the world who are, you know, doing better than you or in a better position than you than what you're in and they want to help you out. And you'll be a fool to say no, you know, but hey, I'm working hard. And if you want to help me out, then absolutely, you know, you take the help and you keep on pushing, you know, and you keep on trying to achieve your goals. And as a result, you know, you're happy. You're making other people happy just by you being happy, you know, so keep trying to push for that keep social networking and um, message the, the greats, you know, don't be afraid to like message like a Leandro Lowe or whatever. You never know if you're going to like respond or, you know, Hey, you know, Hey, Leandro Lowe, I, I, I like your matches. You know, you're, you're one of my favorites to watch, blah, 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 blah. And he says, Oh, thank you. You know, he responds. And also you see him at the world, you see him at the Pan Ams, you, you get a picture with him, you know, and you keep seeing him, you keep showing up bro, he's going to remember you. And eventually you show up to his gym. Hey man, I remember you come train, you know, or like, you just, you know, you build these friendships, these relationships, and that's like jujitsu for you, bro. We're all fighting. We're all samurais. So, like, we have that, like, initial bond. We're, like, all, we're all going to war. Yeah. Pulling on gi pants. <laughs> yeah, bro, we're all pulling our swords out. You know, we, we might die today, you know. <laughs> speaking, speaking of you might die today, I got to ask you, you have lived in Brampton. What oh, the yeah. fuck is going on in Brampton right now? Oh, bro. <laughs> Thank God I'm out of Brampton. I'll say that much. <laughs> like, I, I've met my parents. Me, like, me too. A times, like move downtown, move downtown. I would, I would move into. I, I like take the basement. I'd pay rent, whatever it is. Move downtown, you know. Like my life would be so much easier, bro. I get some like parental help or whatever. You know, my parents like, near me. Like they're, they're, they're like Brampton to me is a whole different world, bro. It's like two hours away, two different transits away. Like I can never get there, bro. I feel terrible. I don't get a visit very much. So I'm like, man, Brampton, bro. I'm just happy I'm in Toronto. I'm happy I'm downtown. I'll just say that much. <laughs> but you know what, man? They produce some tough jujitsu players, bro. 
they produce some really good jujitsu. I'm realizing some really tough guys because they, they have good wrestling already. Like your wrestling teams are pretty good, so I feel like their jujitsu is like following behind. You know, there is. There's a lot of uh, good wrestlers actually coming out of Brampton. Uh, there's yeah, some, there's some at uh, Turner Fenton, Matt Men Wrestling, yep. uh, Heart Lake Hurricanes. Shout out to Coach Kelman. There's yeah, a lot of, there's a lot of big uh, big wrestling coaches out in that area. Yeah, and Coach Kelvin's great too because he's really into jujitsu. He's like he's like showing the kids some jujitsu. You know, he had me down there for like self defense for a little bit just to teach the kids you know grappling because he knew that if he learned that it'll help to bring them to, to more to wrestling as well. You know, we all kind of co mingle. So I like I really like him for that. He's really open minded. So shout out Coach Kelvin. That's awesome. So let me ask you this. So now kind of like things are starting to open up. Like, have you kind of like thought about the future for yourself, whether it's being with your school or is the focus kind of like somewhere else? What have you kind of thought about moving forward? Um, so since the whole COVID thing, I've been doing a lot of security work. I've never done security before that, but I'm, I'm loving it. I'm doing a night shift. And I find just having my days full to focus on me as an athlete you know, training, eating well, all that stuff. Um, I'm really loving that right now. So I'm, I'm in, I'm in no immediate rush to to reopen the gym or to get involved in that right now. I'm just focusing on just you know doing my security work, which kind of helps to pay my bills, and I have my my full day from from 8 a.m. to you know 10 p.m. just to like do whatever I want to do. You know, whether to interview here, to work out, to sleep, to rest, recover. And, you know, I, I usually um, come home already recovered because the job is very, like, you know, chill. You know, it's very relaxing. I just kind of stand up or sit down. Don't got to do too much. If I have any trouble, I just, like, get other people to, like, deal with it. It's not really my thing to deal with. You know? Let's get it off. Yeah. Because, like, we, we, we do security, but there's, like, another security branch within the building. So, like, luckily, like, they actually have to deal with, like, the real problem. So, like, whatever anything happens. Okay. I just like support, I just, start, I just tell them, I just kind of like walk outside to make sure the outside is like clean and you know, nothing's happening. Cause we have a bunch of homeless people right now. And that's what we're dealing with like a homeless crisis because of COVID. So our group is actually helping with that, which I'm, I'm like proud to be involved with, you know, but as a result, I just don't have to do too much work. I just kind of like make sure that they're behaving. If nothing's happening, I'm good. If something's happening, I tell other people. So I go home very recovered, very rested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. For the, for the record, for the record, if your employers are listening, you do not sleep on the job. You work very hard. You don't hand it on. You don't. You don't just pawn off yeah. the work to anybody else, like Aaron always does to That's me. It. So out, everyone's getting knocked out, bro. <laughs> no trouble, bro. Aaron's no trouble. been Aaron's been very rested at work because he gives me all the work. <laughs> that's, 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 that's what that's what good bosses do. I delegate. You delegate. I delegate my work. Hey, yeah. Mike, you, you, go, you go deal with the stupidity. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. Work smarter, not harder. I it's sometimes it. better that you deal with it than I do because you'll get a better result than I will. Because I'm a lot more – I'm a, well, I'm also a lot more mild-mannered than you are. So Very true. <laughs> if I go to somebody and I'm like, hey, man, like, you know, I don't want this place to get shut down. Can you keep your mask on at least somewhat around your face? Versus Aaron going, hey, fucker, put your fucking mask on, you fucking fuck. <laughs> Usually, it's, it's not the, the message that you deliver to people. It's how you deliver it. And I think I'm a, I'm a much better mailman than Aaron is right now. <laughs> I look at it this way. If I've told you three times and you're still being a dickhead, you deserve to be treated like a dickhead. That's, that's my whole thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's true. I, if you see the same person five times in a row, it's like, okay, really? <laughs> like, we have two rules here. Clean up after yourself, which you should probably be doing at a gym anyway. And yeah. just, just. Well, and, and that's the funny thing, where it's just like, everybody now is so, like, hypersensitive over touching stuff and cleaning stuff and all that kind of stuff. And it was like, who weren't really like that before right people yeah. were but not right and so now it's super sensitive and now you think about all the stuff you touch and you're like oh fuck it's like how i didn't die before is quite interesting but Bro, i'll be i'll be at a gym working out 
And like, so you know, you like you generally at the gym, you clean off the machinery, right? You clean off yep. like the seat, whatever else. Bro, my, my girlfriend's trying to clean the dumbbells. She's trying to clean like the, the weights even, like, you know what I mean? The, the, the 45 pound weight. Usually you don't clean that part. She's trying to clean the, the weights, everything. The weights and everything. Tell yeah. her, tell her if she's like, if she's looking for a job, uh, we might be hiring. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, so she's she's really like she's really like nice like that. You know, I'm like, oh, I leave the weights alone. No worries. Just clean your seat, clean whatever, clean the handlebar, bro. She's cleaning everything, bro. I'm like, man, I'm not that nice to them. But like, it, it, it is tough though. You know, what I mean, I'm trying I'm trying to adjust. I I get really hot. Like, I don't know what it is. I sweat really easily. So when I put it on my face, like, it, it, I think it hits me differently, bro. I, I sweat like no one's business, bro. Like, no, like, man, I just boom sweat for no reason. I'll just be. Sitting. <laughs> All of a sudden, just sweating, bro. And you, feel, and you feel like you're eating it like halfway through a workout. I've, I've had that experience yeah. as well where I'm just like, <laughs> is that here in my mouth at like one point? And I'm trying to. Yeah. Bro, my ear pods are like getting damaged, bro. But I can't be wearing a head if I work out. And I'm just too sweaty, bro. <laughs> like, oh, you got to get the waterproof ones. Yeah, I need like waterproof headphones. Yeah, man. It's bad, but hey. They haven't broken yet, so. So, so what type, what type of lifting training are you doing now? Is it more like power based, or is it just more like foundational? Yeah. Where I'm all about power based. I'm just trying to like hit like personal records on the mainly mainly on the deadlifting and squatting, right? Like as I've I've worked out several times in my life. Like I've been like in like not, when I say workout, I mean like I've been into it. Like I've been like. You know, I'm loving it. You know, I, 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 I've um, built a routine, you know, all that stuff, right? But, um, but every time I've done that, I've always been, like, upper body. Like, I, I squatted a little bit. I, I deadlifted a little bit. But I didn't appreciate it enough. I didn't like doing it. It was so hard to do. Um, I didn't see the results right away, so I didn't like it. You know what I mean? But as I've gotten older, I'm like, man, legs are where it's at, bro. You have to have a good pair of legs, bro. Can't can't for- you, you got to stop skipping leg day, bro. Yeah, bro. skip leg day. You can't, you can't be forced gumping it out here, bro. You got to be, you know, full out legs, bro. You got to be running around, whatever else. So I, I've, been, I've been sticking to it, and I'm seeing, like, major results, man. Like, my legs feel a lot stronger. They're looking, like, more filled out. Like, a lot of my pants are not, are not, not are no longer fitting, bro. That's, that's <laughs> good right there, bro. It, it sucks. I'm like, oh, I love these pants. But I'm like – Hey, hey, you know. but, I lo- but I love the gains more. <laughs> yeah, I love the gains. Exactly. My gains. Gains. My, yeah, my, my, my goal for myself is I want to move up to ultra heavyweight. And I'm just going to like get up to like 270. And I just want to be able to, to deadlift Aaron the next time I roll with him and just like snap his gi in half. <laughs> Priorities. Priorities, yeah. That's it, man. 270. That's a good number. 270. 270 yeah, you can do flex, it just flexing yeah. um uh, one thing uh before we wrap up i always like to ask people um this is a question that we've asked like uh, uh, you know off and on and i think you'd have a good uh good opinion on this would a baron bola work in a street fight yes <laughs> elaborate I, 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 please I, I, elaborate I, we need we need the opinion <laughs> I, I believe it'll work because I, I believe first, if you get taken down, to grab the ankle and begin up kicking. Right away, just start up kicking with an ankle grip. That way, you can't escape fully. Then you just gotta shoot that Baron Bolo hook. Like, I don't know if you see how Keenan does it, like how he bridges to catch the hook. That's like a quick way to catch it. Like, no, not too much technique involved. Just thread, quick- thread the, del- the deep Della Hiva in, spin under. Right. Yeah. Right away. If you catch that, grab onto their belt, grab onto their pocket, whatever it is. If they're wearing jeans, if they're if they're wearing a, a sundress, you know, hey man, you sometimes you gotta fight a girl, bro. You gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, um, a, she's attacking me. She's attacking me. Yeah. <laughs> Drink up, bro. Hey man, it's 2020, bro. Equal rights. Equal rights. What if <laughs> What if you get a t- now? Now the now the interesting question: You live in downtown Toronto. There may be a homeless person who may be doing some extracurricular drugs. They they may not have any clothes on. How do you bear and bolo then, bro? 
you gotta grab onto the old frontal tail, brother. <laughs> 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 just, just, just grab the pain and hold on, hold on for dear life. <laughs> okay, I didn't think we're going to swing that way. <laughs> the, the bowl it's, 20, it's, 20, bowl. it's 2020, Aaron. We're very accept, we're very accepting of uh, <laughs> different different cultures, different races, different sex, sexual orientations. We are all one. Grab the. Grab the pain and bolo. That's that. That might be a new shirt. That might be a new shirt. That may. That may. That may uh, be debuting with the Brampton Lives Matter one. That will be coming out soon. <laughs> we're gonna get canceled. <laughs> oh, we're getting canceled. We're gonna. It's gonna be. There's gonna be one shirt that's gonna be a peen grip. We're gonna send that one to you. And then we're going to also send you a Brampton Lives Matter one. Oh, my God. So my Amazonian jiu-jitsu where you have no clothing. <laughs> let's, let's go. You grab yeah, the lapel. Like, now, how do you work lapel guard if the person's, you know, not wearing anything? You the same, the same grip? Like, do you? Uh, full grip, bro. Same grip. That would just be really painful, though. Like, like I would, like if I'm attacking somebody and somebody starts grabbing me down there, I'm just like, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. I'm gonna walk. Up early, then you win, bro. That's good. It's a win-win situation. Oh man! You just gotta grab. You gotta grab life right by the lemons. Just right by, right there, bro. That's it. No less. When life gives you lemons, you bear and bolo with them. That's it. So um, I think. I think oh, I think we lost Aaron. I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap we're gonna wrap up this evening. What we want to do uh, before we before we let you go this evening, we want to ask you. You know, you got any sponsors to thank? Anybody you want to shout out before we let you go this evening? Um, absolutely nobody. Absolutely. <laughs> like this podcast, we're sponsored by no. Oh wait, we we have CanadianProtein.com. Get yourself ten percent off. Use the promo code Choke. Get on there, get some some of your supplement needs. We're uh, we're working on some uh, future sponsorships, and uh, I think Darson may have uh, come out with a great T-shirt idea for the future. <laughs> Guy by the peen, peen and bolo, peen and bolo. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Darson, yeah. I want to thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> it's a great conversation. <laughs> pleasure thanks for having me i think i think we finally broke aaron (laughs) (laughs) it was good no that was awesome i had a great time i really do appreciate you coming on and definitely want to do this in person hopefully when this is all over and we can actually have a studio the whole deal so it'd be great to have you in studio and then roll after it'll be fun and then darcy can and then darcy can do reps on you like he does with all of the acts it's gonna be fun i hit you i hit you with a new bolo that we have the new bolo i'm working on it now I'll, I'll work on it. I'll master it, and I'll hit you with it. Don't worry. I the, like the, it. The peen and bolo. The peen and bolo. <laughs> the peen. <laughs> you're like, no, no, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. No. <laughs> not that one. <laughs> I'm gonna no, have no. my gee on. You don't need it, to do that. What, 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 uh, what oh, be on. Okay, okay. What 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 the ref doesn't see, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate rule. That's true. It, it is true. true. Oh, man. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming on tonight. Appreciate it. Oh, big boa. Big boa. Big boa legend.